Good evening. Welcome to the YouTube channel of Instituto Cervantes, Manchester and Leeds. Today we will have the second uh, session of the series of about the poetic reason of Maria Zambrano. Maria Zambrano, that as you know, is one of the leading philosophers of the 20th century in Spain and we could in the Hispanic world, and uh, who had a uh, very uh, strong influence in the uh, society and in the ideas about the reality that she developed. One of the key uh, uh, studies of Maria Zambrano was about the poetic reason. And in this meeting, we will have the chance with uh, Professor Beatriz Caballero Rodriguez uh, to analyze the poetic uh, reason and uh, to see how it works in the Maria Zambrano thoughts through the text of the author. And uh, we can uh, uh, say that uh, the meeting of today will we'll see, uh, um, we will hear about how uh, poetic reason works in action. But uh, for those who didn't attend the first meeting, let me introduce a bit about, to say something about our lecture, Beatriz Caballero, uh, Rodriguez, who is a senior lecturer at the University of Stark uh, Clyde in Glasgow and author of several books and articles on 20th century of ideas of Spain, particularly in the areas of memory, trauma, exile, and political philosophy. Her publications include two monographs, uh, against instrumental reason, neo-Marxism and spirituality in the thought of Jose Luis Lopez Aranguren and Jesus Aguirre. And uh, most recently, she published Maria Zambrano, A Life of Poetic Reason and Political Commitment. Uh, let me tell you also that this series is part of a, a global program that we are uh, developing with uh, Professor, Ca Professor Caballero Rodriguez, because um, as I said, uh, Maria Zambrano is a very, very important figure for the Hispanic culture. And in this series, we will have not only lectures, but at the end of the year, we will have also exhibitions uh, about uh, the works of uh, Maria Zambrano and in cooperation with other institutes in uh, different places uh, in the world we will show throughout the, this time the uh, ideas, the influence of Maria Zambrano, and also the people who have been by influence from her uh, philosophy. So thank you very much for being there, and I hope you will enjoy this lecture. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining in. So following from last week, when we had an opportunity to introduce Poetic Reason, we discussed how Poetic Reason was born and some of its key features, but I think it would be really interesting for us to do together this week is to tackle some of her writings. Um, so let me start by sharing with you the PowerPoint. And as you can see from that PowerPoint, this week's session is um, entitled Poetic Reasons, some key readings, very descriptively, um, because that's really the purpose of today. So um, let's start by discussing the availability of um, some of Maria Zambrano's works in English. So for those of you who may prefer to go directly to the Spanish, here is a brief reference. The book was written while she was in exile in Mexico during the early 1950s, but the first edition wasn't published until 1989. And it was published by Mondadori. And here you can see uh, the front page of that publication. Um, and most, the, the most recent publication, however, can be found on the sixth volume of the complete works. And you also have the front page of that here. Um, as, but as I said, if, if you need to go to the translation, this is a fantastic work and I highly recommend it. I can't praise it enough. Um, there are other translations as well. Um, in particular, there's a compilation of critical essays 
and an anthology of selected uh, texts, including the legendary Towards uh, Knowledge of the Soul. And that has been published as a special issue of the journal for the history of European ideas and uh, has been published under the title Maria Zambrano Amongst the Philosophers, an introduction. Um, there's another uh, anthology, in this case it's a bilingual anthology, and I highly recommend that as well, and it's entitled Maria Zambrano Between the Caribbean and the Mediterranean, a bilingual anthology. And so uh, there's plenty there to get you started um, in English. So as today's session is devoted to, Maria, to reading Maria Zambrano together, I think it's well worth spending a few minutes before we do that, reflecting on her style. And uh, just like we were saying last week that uh, the main feature or the, the main contribution to intellectual uh, history that Maria Zambrano is known for is her poetic reason. And however, this hasn't been a feature of her writing from the start, but rather an aspiration and a process. Similarly, her style changed um, throughout the years. So it's interesting to note how she started off with a discursive style. It is true that Maria Zambrano has always had an affinity uh, with poetry and um, her style does have poetic features from day one. Um, however, uh, what I mean by saying that her early writings are can be considered discursive, what I mean is that she explains what she means. Okay, she takes uh, time to take us through the, ex the explanations of um, in, that she needs in order to make her point. She makes her point using the kind of reason that we are used to and that we would expect as part of a philosophical discourse. However, um, she increasingly moves away from these favoring uh, more and more uh, of those poetic tools and relying, relying increasingly on the use of symbolism and metaphor, and not just that, but uh, the, the, other res uh, the other features that we discussed last week, creating a different kind of rationality altogether. And so she uh, continues with her discursive style until, say, the late 40s, early 50s, but from the 50s onwards, her style becomes increasingly poetic, by which I mean not just the use of metaphor and symbolism, but her turning away from explanation and relying on the tools uh, afforded by poetry in order to convey her meaning. And that is what we would um, explore in detail today. So if we look at, um, as, as, we, as I was saying at the beginning, uh, the, her works are very vast and I cannot comment on every single one of them. So I've just made a very small selection and I have to emphasize it's my selection, someone else may select others, but these ones in my opinion are particularly representative in order to help us um, survey um, how uh, what, what her main topics may be, some, some of those, and how uh, her style evolves. So I think that Hacia un saber sobre el alma, Towards the Knowledge of the Soul, which is a compilation of a number of essays that she publishes during the 30s and 40s, um, her early work at any rate, um, and, and this includes Porque se escribe, why should we write, why does one write, and also Towards the Knowledge of the Soul, which are two seminal um, essays in her early writings. And so um, this compilation it's, uh, took place much, much later. The, years, um, 19, in the year of publication is 1989, but as I said earlier, uh, it reflects, uh, it, it includes much earlier works. Um, on the other hand, we also have 
uh, a constant tension between philosophy and poetry. And I think it's worth mentioning these two books, one of them, Philosophia y Poesia, Philosophy and Poetry. We already had a chance to explore that in some detail last week. Uh, and another uh, book in a similar vein was published that same year. It's called Pensamiento y Poesia en la Vida Española, uh, published in 1939, also just after the Spanish Civil War. And it looks very much at the same topic, but perhaps from a slightly different perspective, focusing in particular on the Spanish heritage. Um, for those of you who may be interested in her political uh, thought, I think Horizonte del Liberalismo, which is her very first book, is a very good way um, to start. And I think we also discussed that briefly last week. So I'm more interested, perhaps more interested um, in this next book, which is the last book that she publishes, which is expressly devoted to uh, politics. This is called Persona y Democracia person and democracy and uh, it was published in 1958 and uh, it reflects precisely on on what it says on on the title on what it is the on what it is uh to be a person and what uh what constitutes a genuine democracy so um it, as i said it was written on the 1958 but it makes a very good read uh to this day which i think it uh, it tackles some of the issues that we are still uh grappling with many i think most of which remain unresolved to this day so um, i think it's a good opportunity uh to underlie the uh, the currency of many of Zambrano's ideas and questions. Um, so if we now move forward to her later work, now her in her mature work, um, now we move in, uh, within the realm of poetic reason. And as I said, she published extensively, I'm not including here her work on dreams, for example, um, but, but I think I've chosen two titles particularly because um, they help us uh, understand better what she means by poetic reason, and she expressly tackles that issue. So one of them is Claros del Bosque, published in 1977, Forest Glades. And um, the, uh, here she explores in full that poetic style uh, typical of her uh, poetic reason and uh, the La Aurora of the Dawn, uh, a slightly later work where she um, devotes a lot of time to think about what that kind of reason uh, looks like, what its features are, and how it's um, it can be um, it, it it can be thought of in terms of a dawn. And these two works are um, what we are going to spend time focusing on today. Uh, I've, I've selected a couple of extracts, and I would like to use them as as a way of um, of making an incursion into the language uh, of poetic reason. Before we tackle today's readings, let's start by having a very quick recap of what it is that we discussed last week about poetic reason. So first of all, it's worth remembering its main aims, which are on the one hand to overcome the limitations of discursive reason and on the other, to do it by means of bringing together philosophy and poetry and also a sense of the sacred. So what are the key features? I think uh, last week's quote from Note of a Method was very useful already in highlighting uh, what I think, in my opinion, is the core feature of poetic reason, which is that um, it cannot be understood um, by looking at content or style uh, by themselves. It's about the combination, how those two work together, how those two com uh, combine together uh, to create a wider reason. So uh, Maria Zambrano emphasizes time and time again how her aim 
although she is very critical of the established rationality, her aim is not to do away with reason, but rather to create a wider reason, to go beyond the established rationality, to incorporate many aspects which she considers essential to the human experience, but uh, which are traditionally excluded from rationality. Uh, in order to do that, she relies heavily on that poetic language, which is why I must emphasize again the combination uh, between content and style. And she emphasizes a sense of an embodied reason. In other words, one of her techniques to convey beyond what would normally be conveyed with uh, an explanation within discursive reason is to um, not just talk about abstract ideas and concepts, but also to remind us of, um, of what different um, experiences are, uh, to remind us of, uh, of how it feels to be a person within a body. And, and so that's why metaphor and symbolism are key, because those are just um, the way she uses them is to go beyond uh, the thought, beyond the idea, beyond the abstraction, and to link that idea to lived experience and to a sensory experience, which is anchored on the body. So that's why essentially, poetic reason uh, moves within the sphere of the knowledge of the experience. So in contrast with the explanations and arguments traditional of Western rationality, Zambrano chooses to build her meaning through the number of strategies that we have just discussed, resulting on a number of layers. Um, I think we've talked already enough about these different strategies and what is far more interesting is to look at them in practice, how Zambrano uh, uses them effectively. So, uh, as I said, there's a huge amount of texts to choose from. In this particular instance, I've selected a short extract, um, a very well-known extract from uh, Forest Glades. Uh, it's extracted from Claros del Bosque, and it's in fact the appendix to this um, work, because I'm referring to what it is effectively a longer extract. I'm providing here the full reference both to the complete works and also to the first edition of this book, um, in case you're interested. So uh, without further ado, um, let's uh, delve into it. So the extract in question, the appendix, is entitled El Espejo de Atenea, Atenea's Mirror. And I've chosen it partly because it is um, a very, uh, it's one of her seminal books, but also because it's a very well-known piece. Um, I think largely because it's so evocative and it gives us a fantastic example of how she, um, she moves within this uh, form of rationality. So what she does here is that she takes a, a well-known uh, story from Greek mythology, and in this case, the story of Medusa that many of you would be familiar with. And what she does is that she uses that, that she uses that story as a starting point uh, because it would be resonant um, to me, uh, with many of us. She would count on the fact that we are familiar with that story. But what she does is that she, uh, on the one hand, takes many of the implications. Uh, already existent within the story of Medusa and uh, takes them to its ultimate consequences. Uh, so extracting a lot of meaning and implications from that. But um, not just that, she also uh, appropriates the story, she appropriates the myth and gives it a twist um, to help illustrate the kind of reason that she is um, going towards. So I think um, it, it, is, uh, it is a few pages long, it is 10 pages long, so I think it's beyond what we can um, reproduce in, in this talk, but um, I think what would be useful to, uh, for me to do is perhaps to summarize the gist of the story, and then we can spend some time um, looking at, at a specific extract that I've selected for you. So, 
I think the, the, the first place to start from is the story, the, the mythological story uh, that has been handed down to us from tradition. And perhaps the first thing to note there is that uh, mythology, um, as, as you know, it's, it's uh, the result of a story that is being told and retold through generations. So in that process of retelling a story, uh, that sense of appropriation and change, it's, it's part and parcel of, of what mythology is. So that means that from the start, there are a number of different versions to this story. There's no canonical version. Um, I'm going to go um, not necessarily with my take, but with what echoes seems to uh, be echoing uh, the Zambrano's, uh, the, the take that Zambrano is referring to when, um, when developing uh, this, this piece of writing. So uh, we, we start with the story of Medusa, who is one of three sisters, who was, uh, to start with, incredibly beautiful, and she was serving as an attendant uh, in Athena's temple. Um, her beauty drew the attention of the god Poseidon, and he ruptured the maiden, and, she, uh, and, and as a result of this uh, encounter, uh, she became pregnant. Uh, not just that, but the fact that uh, Poseidon uh, became uh, became interested in her to that degree made Athena uh, angry uh, and as a result she decided to punish Medusa for that transgression and perceived a transgression in the eyes of Athena and the result is the well-known um, Medusa with uh, turning what it used to be beautiful hair into a head full of serpents, full of snakes. Not just that, but anyone who would look upon her face would immediately turn to stone. Now, moving the story forward, uh, Perseo is a Greek hero who had, among other tasks, where uh, was given the task to um, to to get to uh, Medusa and kill her, and this had been an impossible task to that point, and he could only uh, he could only attempt that because he had the help of the gods. In particular, he had the help of Athena, who gave uh, Perseo a, a mirror, and this would be a device that would allow Perseo not to look directly onto Medusa's uh, head, not to look directly to her face, because that would turn him to stone immediately uh, because uh, of the monstrosity of the snakes uh, and, and her um, ugliness. Uh, and instead, he decided to approach her and he would uh, look at the reflection uh, instead uh, in the mirror provided by Athena and that way he managed to slay uh, Medusa by cutting her head off. That is the, the, the in, a, uh, in a nutshell the story of Medusa. However, uh, Zambrano uses that story and gives us a number of twists. On the one hand, uh, she stretches uh, the, the implications of what is going on and in, in Zambrano's version, Athena decides to punish Medusa not because of any trans, not because of jealousy that uh, Poseidon may have been interested in Medusa because of her beauty, not because uh, this uh, act of transgression took place within Athena's temple, but rather because. Uh, Athena, uh, well known as the goddess of knowledge, uh, was also uh, without descendants, and she represents a particular type of knowledge. Uh, in contrast with that, we have Medusa, who's beautiful, but not just that, she is also fertile, because the other thing we know in this story is that as a result of uh, Poseidon's uh, attentions and required attentions, um, Medusa became pregnant. And the reason why, according to Zambrano, 
um, Athena decided to punish Medusa as uh, to prevent a new lineage, uh, a competing lineage, uh, a lineage that would uh, displace the Athena from her privileged position. And that's already very interesting to us because she is suggesting not just an alternative story, but she's suggesting that reason as we know it uh, could have taken different paths and that reason as we know it is just one possibility and that uh, there was a time when a different possibility, a different uh, form of reason was possible and that that path was cut short. That's, that's what she's uh, suggesting, at least that's my reading, uh, my interpretation of that text. Uh, so we can see how she is talking on the one hand about different possibilities of reason, but also she is uh, very much emphasizing the uh, sterility within the reason proposed by Athena in contrast with the fertility um, contained in the reason uh, proposed uh, or, or the, the reason embodied by Medusa. Uh, the other twist that Zambrano provides is that she is somehow empowering or reinstating, uh, rescuing the figure, the figure of Medusa, uh, emphatically uh, emphasizing that it wasn't her ugliness uh, that turned, uh, that had this effect on, on lookers, uh, that um, despite the course, uh, Medusa continued to have uh, to be beautiful, uh, to have a stunning beauty. So uh, it's again about uh, reinterpreting and, 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 and giving a different emphasis to the myth that we are familiar with. So why is that interesting for us? I think um, I, there are many different elements of this story that we could devote a lot of attention to. Um, I think that's one of the uh, features of poetic reason that I think perhaps uh, you could already see a glimpse of last week, and it's that it's packed with information, precisely because it communicates through symbolism, metaphor, uh, the contradiction, the use of established uh, myths and established archetypes, and uh, incorporating new trees, and particularly uh, all of this results in layer upon layer upon layer of meaning. Um, that means that it's an incredibly rich text, but also a complex one, open, deliberately open to interpretation because it demands the engagement of the reader in order to, uh, to glean uh, meaning from it. And, and that is where the experiential aspect comes in. And that is where the metaphor, the images, the symbolism become powerful, because it's not about saying something, it's about uh, waking up a, a, a memory in you, it's about waking up a, an emotion, uh, a sensation so that you just uh, so that you don't just have the abstract concept but that you relate to that knowledge you relate to that information uh, uh, in a more holistic uh, bodily uh, coherent way altogether so um, let's finally look at the extract uh, from Zambrano in this case I think uh, it's it's interesting and useful for us to become clearer on what poetic reason is, to focus particularly on Zambrano's understanding of the mirror. So um, it is, in, in fact, the title that Zambrano chooses for this story, El Espejo de Atenea, Atenea's Mirror. Let's, let's discuss that concept in more detail. So I'll, I'll read the Spanish, you have the English uh, beneath. Una figura vista en el espejo carece de ese fondo último que la mirada va a buscar más allá de la apariencia, pues que la vista se une al oído. Cuando se mira directamente, se espera y se da lugar al escuchar. Nadie escucha a la figura reflejada por un espejo, mientras que a las aguas se va dispuesto a escuchar. So, she is considering she's, ref uh, she's thinking about how it is possible to defeat uh, Medusa 
through a mirror. How could a mirror be so powerful? What is the power of a mirror? Uh, but also what are its limitations? So she's thinking about how a mirror provides us, provides us with a reflection. And this is powerful. It's a tool for seeing. It's a tool for seeing uh, something that even, even something that we could not otherwise see as it is the case with Medusa. However, uh, my reading of this, and I have to emphasize every time that this is my personal interpretation. Remember that this is complex, has many layers. I'm not going to spend more time saying that, but it's that, that I would just like to, to emphasize that it's, it's my interpretation. There are other possible interpretations. So the way I read this is that Zambrano, um, it's not just emphasizing the usefulness of a mirror because it allows us to have an image, uh, but also it's, it's particularly underlying the limitations of that image. And what she's saying is that the image is flat in a way. Well, uh, what she says is incomplete. It lacks, uh, it, it lacks nuances. So she's comparing the image you see, the reflection you see, on a mirror with the reflection you see on running water. And one of the ways in which she draws attention to the fact that the image of a mirror is entirely different, is something else, uh, and not just something different, but something less than the actual image, is that it lacks sound. Zambrano emphasizes the importance of sound, of stopping and listening, of engaging, because sound, requires for us to hear, it requires that uh, aspect of stop and listen. And what she's saying is that a reflection is soundless, whereas the real image or even the image in running water and the allusion to running water has to do with life, uh, the life of a river, for example, uh, would, uh, would have sound, okay? So uh, it is useful, but it is not complete. That becomes much clearer in, uh, later on in that same text. Let's continue reading. Nos propone y ofrece el espejo de Atenea un modo de visión, un medio adecuado para la reflexión en uno de sus aspectos. Nos habla de modos de conocimiento que solo son posibles en cierto medio de visibilidad. La razón racionalista, esquematizada, da un solo medio de conocimiento. Mas el ser humano habría de recuperar otros medios de visibilidad que su mente y sus sentidos mismos reclaman por haberlos poseído alguna vez poéticamente, o litúrgicamente, o metafísicamente. So, what she's saying here, in my view, is that she's emphasizing the usefulness of the mirror but how it is only useful so far. It is only useful um, in order to allow us a certain um, mode, a certain way of knowledge, but that is not the be all and end all um, knowledge, that there are other ways of uh, achieving knowledge. And she uses that to now expressly criticize rationalist reason. Um, to say that this is just one of the possible modes of reason and that there should be others. Not just that, she using the myth, um, making reference to that myth, she suggests that it's not something that we need to invent afresh, but that uh, human beings are able to um, innately somehow remember uh, other forms of knowledge which used to exist, which had existed already, uh, which we are familiar with, even if it's not um, on a rational, clear um, way, we have uh, a memory, a poetic memory, a liturgic, um, having to do with the lit here, the lit liturgy makes a reference to the sacred or even metaphysically. Um, she emphasizes that that knowledge is there on different levels even though it's not the level of reason uh, that has been established, the reason associated with Athena. She is emphasizing the need to go beyond that and explore other forms of knowledge. So in a first take of this reading, it's easy to reach the conclusion that 
Zambrano is still banging on about the same old topics that she was um, discussing in the year 1939. Effectively, she's still uh, criticizing the established rationality, the reason of rationalism, the reason of the Enlightenment, and in contrast, she's advocating for a different kind of reason, a richer one, her poetic reason. So this sounds terribly familiar. We know that she's been going on about this for a long time. However, she's not doing the same thing. What is key here is to realize that she's just she's not just advocating for a different kind of reason, her poetic reason. Effectively, what she's doing is that she's now exercising that reason. She's demonstrating what uh, that reason would look like and how to convey information by means of that reason. She's moving within the coordinates of poetic reason, and that is what is distinctive about uh, her mature work. Um, in order to move on, I thought that it would be interesting to choose another text. Uh, I've continued to um, place emphasis on the concept of poetic reason, uh, but um, I, I find it necessary to introduce here a kind of disclaimer in the sense that uh, I wouldn't want to give the impression that this is all Maria Zambrano talks about. In fact, uh, she doesn't uh, like to talk explicitly about poetic reason itself, as she herself um, said in, in the quote we saw last week, taken from Notes of a Method. Instead, uh, I've selected specifically these quotes uh, to illustrate, to help us understand what poetic reason is and how it works. But I also want to emphasize at the same time, not only that uh, her work, her production is immensely vast, but also that she deals with a wide variety of topics and is well worth exploring. Um, she writes a lot more um, about uh, say dreams, dreams and time are um, a big issue for her as it is uh, the concept of delirium, uh, confession, uh, even uh, politics as we've seen a couple of books devoted to that. Um, so her range is, is, is much broader than the issue of poetic reason. However, these texts are not so much representative of all of the topics she covered, but representative perhaps of, um, of, of the examples of what poetic, when, when she talks explicitly about what poetic reason is. Um, so this is, uh, I've, I've emphasized a number of times that one of the core features of poetic reason is that metaphor, it's key. Um, it's one of the building blocks of poetic reason that enables uh, a, a different, more nuanced expression uh, that it's uh, anchored in experience. And, and, and I think a fantastic example for that is her use of the concept of aurora or dawn. Um, it's, it's, I'd say it's, it's a fantastic example also because according to Thumbrano herself, this uh, image of the dawn uh, encapsulates uh, what she means by poetic reason. So um, that's, that's why I've selected uh, a, a reference to, to this uh, book in particular, um, because um, we're going to deal with, with a long uh, extract. Um, I've provided here the reference for those of you who are interested in the complete works as well as the first edition of the book. Okay, so without further ado, um, I do apologize because I don't normally like to include such long quotations, but I think this is kind of the point of today's session to be able to sink our teeth into the text. Um, so that, that's why I think unless we have these longer texts, it's very difficult to get that sense, that, that feel for the way it is written, because remember that content and style go hand in hand in Zambrano. So let's do as we've done before. Uh, let's read the text uh, together. You have the translation at the bottom, and then we'll take a few minutes to comment on it. So um, the, the, she starts off the text by um, almost apologizing with a disclaimer, um, saying that she confesses uh, she feels uh, in this text, she feels the need to confess and to be 
uh, to give us a straight account of the kind of philosophy she's doing, which um, I think it's, it goes a long way to explaining um, or to justifying why she, um, she chooses to explain once again what poetic reason is, despite the fact that she is renowned, uh, that she is uh, giving up explanations, that she chooses different ways of conveying information. So uh, it's interesting, I think, to have that uh, in mind, that she um, should start this extract with that information. And then um, th th this, is, uh, as, this is the part of a, of a larger segment, but uh, I think this is the one relevant to us. La Aurora, que no nos ha ofrecido la posibilidad de ser un conocimiento propiamente filosófico, una episteme, nos impone inexorablemente su condición de pertenecer al mundo de lo cognoscible. Desde el primer momento en que se la mira, nos mira ella a su vez, pidiéndonos, requiriéndonos el que la miremos. Exige ella una actitud del hombre acerca de su propio ser, con conocimiento de su lugar que le conduce al encuentro de su propio ser. Guía, pues... Si por guía entendemos la aparición de algo, un suceso, una presencia que sacara al sujeto de sí, de la situación en que estrictamente está apresado, en una ignorancia que es inmovilidad. La inmovilidad en el ser humano es intrascendencia. Conocer, conocerse es trascenderse, fluir en el interior del ser. So, again, again, it's very dense, very packed with meaning. Let's unpack a little bit of this together. So it's telling, um, on the one hand, the title of the segment is Guia Aurora. So we know that she is talking about Aurora and she's doing it, considering it as a guide. And here she explains in, which, in what way she does that. Um, it's telling that she uses the word Aurora with capital letters, not every time, but sometimes she chooses the use of a capital letter. And that's because she's playing on the double uh, meaning of Aurora, something that Zambrano loves to do. She loves to use words that would have different layers of meaning associated to them. So in this sense, Aurora refers to the time of day, uh, daybreak, just after the night is over, just before the sun rises, is that instant in which you start seeing um, sunlight, uh, but, but it's not full day yet. So that's the precise moment that she's referring to. But she uses capital letters here because it is also a reference to uh, a Roman goddess that goes by that name. Um, so uh, it's but by using a reference to the mythology, we know that she is um, using a, a knowledge, uh, a, an archetype that we are supposed to be familiar with. Uh, she is anchoring uh, the knowledge that she proposes on tradition and she is spinning it in a particular personal way. Okay, so we've seen how Zambrano often um, in, uh, does this. We've seen this in reference to Medusa, and this is a different take on it. So, la aurora, que nos ha ofrecido la posibilidad de un conocimiento propiamente filosófico. So, she's saying that she considers that there is knowledge to be found in, in, in the realm of the dawn, but it's not a, a traditionally philosophical knowledge as in, in the sense that we would consider uh, it to be in the so-called uh, Western philosophical tradition, okay? So why Aurora? So if you remember from last week, Zambrano, um, it's uh, equates this philosophical uh, knowledge to light in the sense of bright, clear light um, in a wink to Descartes, who was uh, claiming the need for clear and distinct ideas. Um, so it's that kind of light uh, that clarifies things, but it's also a blinding light, a, a light that by being too bright, it may also lead to blindness, okay? So that would be a reference to the uh, excessive pride that she associates with this type of reason. However, um, you'd need some light 
uh, because um, otherwise there's no knowledge. So darkness is not the place of knowledge. She thinks that the place of knowledge is just that in between. And in this sense, Zambrano's thought advocates for, uh, uh, it's positioned very well in liminality, in liminal space, in those in-betweens. And, and, and the perfect almost in between, uh, if, if we continue with the metaphor of light or lack thereof, is of course the aurora, the dawn, that midpoint between uh, day and night in which you start glimpsing things, okay? So it means it's a far more humble position from which to acquire knowledge because you have to admit that you don't have full access to uh, to, to see everything, uh, that your knowledge is limited. And she also says that from the very beginning, uh, she expresses it in an interesting way, saying that that dawn looks, us, looks back at us, that it demands that we position ourselves in the world. And this is interesting because uh, from ancient times, one of the ways in which uh, human beings could determine quite literally position was by looking at the sun, at the movement of the sun. So this is, um, if you need to orient, to orient yourself, to, to gather your bearings, the first thing we would do is to uh, look at where the sun is, look at the time of day, uh, sorry, be aware of the time of day, and that would give us a sense of position. So this is how uh, this metaphor uh, this knowledge by metaphor works. It starts from the literal, and we know that this is um, one of the uses uh, which can be associated with the position of the sun, in this case, the racing sun. It quite literally help, uh, can help us to get our bearings, and then we extrapolate that to the metaphorical. Now, it means that it helps us but that, that by looking at uh, the dawn, then we gain knowledge about where we are and, uh, and it, it helps us get um, our bearings in a more metaphorical way with regards to being, okay? Um, so it talks about how immobility is equated to ignorance and uh, it talks about the need to transcend that ignorance, to transcend that immobility, how the aurora incorporates uh, movement. If you think about uh, the aurora, the aurora is a process, is the process of the sun starting to, um, to, to, raise, uh, to rise. So uh, that movement, it's part and parcel of the possibility of the aurora. It's a process. And, and, and it reminds uh, the human being uh, as well that for her to, uh, this is a, one of the famous quotations uh, that we associate with Zambrano, conocerse es trascenderse, to know oneself is to transcend oneself. And she goes on to explain further what that means, fluir en el interior del ser. So she also talks how the human being is also a process. We need to flow, we need to move forward, we need to change. Um, and, and knowledge requires that change, that sense of going beyond, to transcend oneself. Let's continue now with a further quotation from the same text. And here she says, En alguna parte de este cosmos, la aurora tiene un hijo, varios a la vez. Ella no muere y da luz, al fin y al cabo, al mismo sol que es la fuente de la vida. Ella fuente de la fuente. Así, pues, el conocimiento que aquí se invoca, por el que se suspira, este conocimiento postula, pide, que la razón se haga poética sin dejar de ser razón. So, here she talks about the relationship between dawn and light, dawn and the sun. And what she says is that dawn not only never dies, it renews itself constantly or herself because she personifies it as feminine, um, taking, uh, carrying on from the uh, tradition in reference to 
the Roman mythology that we mentioned at the beginning. Um, so she, the dawn, the aurora, uh, does, does not die, but she renews herself day after day. And here she uses another play on words. Uh, in Spanish it says, ella no muere y da luz al fin y al cabo al mismo sol. Dar luz means to give light, but it also means to give birth. And this is precisely uh, what happens in the case of Dawn. Dawn is what uh, gives way to uh, the rising sun, which um, eventually um, it's, it's what we normally associate with the source of life. So that's why she refers to ella, she, the Dawn, is the source of the source. So if we consider the sun to be the source of light, then dawn is the source of the sun. So in other words, she is uh, defending the, uh, the power of dawn. She is reclaiming that uh, subdued power that has gone by almost unnoticed. She's reclaiming that uh, and she's doing so by, uh, by inviting us to rethink, to reframe its relationship towards the sun. And, and, and she goes on uh, to, to once again invoke the need for a poetic reason, which uh, again, she underlies the need not to leave reason behind, but to incorporate the poetic aspect, which she's effectively doing already uh, through this form of communication. So this is another example in which she's advocating for this form of poetic reason while she's exercising it effectively in practice. Um, so what is poetic reason after all? Where does this leave us? Um, there have been a number of different uh, attempts to understand what poetic reason is, and to this day there's no agreement against uh, amongst scholars. So some say that poetic reason is a style, and that makes sense because we've seen that style is at the core of, um, of, of what poetic reason does. Others postulate that in fact poetic reason is a method because it, it sets out to gain knowledge in a certain way. It tells us how to access that knowledge. Others say that, in fact, it goes one step beyond and it's not a method per se, but rather a form of knowledge. It's, it's a, a way, a different form of knowledge. Um, so not just um, going beyond reason as the main source of knowledge, and we should incorporate poetic reason as just another form of knowledge. Uh, or it could be a framework, and my money is on this last one. From my point of view, what poetic reason does is that for us, it sets a framework uh, from which, on the one hand, to overcome the absolutism of reason that Zambrano denounces, but it's also a framework which is specifically designed to be life affirming. As we've seen time and time again, it's not just anthropomorphic in that it tries to incorporate the different elements that comprise the human being, but it's also supportive um, in that one of its aims is uh, to enable the human being to flourish. So in essence, and um, from my perspective, what poetic reason does or sets out to do at any rate is to establish a framework, not just from which to think, but also from which to act. Uh, because um, remember how politics is uh, politics and ethics uh, are also incorporated into this framework. Crucially, considering poetic reason as a framework means that Poetic reason need not end with Maria Zambrano's work, but rather that way poetic reason would be a legacy, one that which, uh, from which we can build upon and work within. It would be a framework from which we can continue to think and act and crucially from which to create. And with this, we've come to the end of the talk. Thank you for joining me and thank you to the Instituto Cervantes for hosting this seminar.